Just yeah. Okay, lovely. Well, I can see. Now we're on. Yes. Lovely. Okay. Yes, we are. Absolutely. So honesty, um, such a pleasure to host you on uh, Mahatatva for our community and this lovely session that you're you've agreed to do uh, for us for designing an early years curriculum. I know you are the best because I've worked with you at the British School and I think you were fantabulous. The children <laughs> loved you and you were never in the staff room and never in the corridors because you were just creating some resource for the children. So, <laughs> uh, I remember you as a very hardworking colleague and somebody we all looked up to where early years was concerned and we are so happy to have you here. Well, it's an absolute pleasure, Deepti. And I would say, you know, that time working with you and colleagues at the British School in Delhi was a formative part of my um, career as a teacher um, and enormously precious, really, to be able to go and work in another country with um, colleagues with different backgrounds and different approaches. And, and I think really, really important early experience for me that's helped me to work in a number of different schools. Um, so I work currently at Frensham Heights, um, which is an independent school here in the UK. Um, it's a progressive school. It's been um, open for about 100 years. I think our 100th anniversary is actually next year and wow. was originally set up by two um, ladies as a liberal progressive school. Um, and I've been working there now for, this will be my third year we go into. Obviously, we've had the disruption of COVID that every teacher has right. to go through. Um, but since I arrived, I've been looking at um, the great early, I did a, um, inherit a very um, passionate early years curriculum. And my uh, last couple of years have been looking at ways that we can um, build on the foundations we have. Um, and look to implement um, some of the new um, ideas about early years that are beginning to emerge here in the UK. And um, Deepti and I were just talking before we went live about um, some of the changes that are happening in India. And maybe I'm hoping that what I talk about today might be valuable to colleagues um, in India. Um, and I'm very happy to link up with people at the end of my talk. I'll share my email address. Um, it would be lovely to hear from maybe former colleagues or from colleagues um, from new new connections as well. Um, so we'll yeah, we look forward to learning from you, Honesty, as always. You're such a great uh, mentor of sorts for the early years. And uh, that's what we see you as. So over to you. Thank you very much, Deepsi. So I'm hoping that this is going to all work now. I'm going to click over to my slides. And I'm hoping you can see my first slide um, with um, a picture there of my classroom. Um, this is taken from last term. We had um, what we call in the UK a heat wave, where um, it was probably only about 28 degrees Celsius. But for the, us, that's a hot day. And uh, the children and I um, were talking about people living in hot countries and how they live. And we constructed a Bedouin tent. So hopefully you can see a picture of our Bedouin tent that we built um, in the classroom. And we all got dressed up and we actually made some mint tea from mint that we went and gathered outside in the playground um, and sat inside and had some mint tea, which was very delicious. So I'm going to be talking to about designing an early years curriculum today. And here's a picture of the school that I work at. Um, you're very welcome to Google Frensham Heights. Um, it's a lovely old building um, and a huge site that we have um, in Surrey. It's about 120 acres. So we are extremely fortunate to be able to take the children outside a great deal of the time um, to explore nature and to explore a really open ended, um, exciting environment. And uh, I just thought I'd share a picture uh, with you of, <laughs> this is a picture that Maddie drew this year. And this is just to remind us why we do what we do. Um, I get to work in a lovely place with fantastic colleagues, but I'm very fortunate to have some wonderful children. And I really like this monster. I'm not quite sure what his name is. It looks like Essios or something like that. And he's got some lovely rainbow colored teeth. Um, so there's Maddie's monster. Okay, so just before we dive in, and I'll start explaining what we do at Frensham Heights, I thought um, a moment just to reflect on what child-led learning is. 
Um, we at Frencham Heights are very much trying to promote the idea of child-led learning. And I wonder if you have a moment to reflect on what are the three words that come into your head when you think of child-led learning? So I'm just going to click back to the broadcast. I don't know if we've got, if you do want to comment at all, um, during my presentation, I'd be very happy to see that. And um, I am going to share now with you what my thoughts about child-led learning are and what our thoughts are in um, at Frencham Heights. Um, so our belief about child-led learning really is that it's um, exciting and fun. Um, it's open-ended. It can go in varied directions during the day. You can uh, think that today is going to start in one way and suddenly it ends up somewhere completely different. Um, Child-led learning um, is the opportunity to be creative. Um, it could be a bit chaotic, maybe. Um, it could be something that you find as a practitioner you're not used to. Um, it can fill you with a bit of dread. How are you going to ensure that these children also pick up all the skills that we want them to have as they progress throughout their education? So at Frencham Heights, we are primarily led by this idea of child-led learning. Um, and in this session today, I want to talk to you about, I've broken it into three areas, what our intent is at Frencham Heights, what our starting point is, and our ethos versus the national curriculum, the national picture here in the UK, um, pressures that we have on us. And I'm sure that colleagues um, in India as well have got pressures of maybe testing um, and baseline testing, that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to talk about the implementation, so how we implement our curriculum in our environment and through our planning. And then lastly, I want to talk about the impact that we um, and how we can measure it, how we can assess and review the impact of our environment and our teaching on the children in nursery and reception. So at Frencham Heights, we have a nursery of uh, children who join us from about two and a half, um, and then they spend two years with us and they move into reception class. It's the first year of um, education in the UK when they are in the year that they turn five. Um, so we may have children that spend three years with us, spending two years in nursery and then a year in reception before they move into year one. That just hopefully gives you an idea of the ages we're talking about. So our intent in our setting um, is here on my next slide. Um, we want children to become lifelong learners. We very much believe in play, providing unique experiences and nurturing relationships. Um, I'm very lucky to have a group of very experienced early years practitioners working with me who are excellent and provide a wonderful um, nurturing environment for children. Um, we want our curriculum to be led by the children, offering them the skills that they need to develop. Um, and we hope to combine the best of early years approaches. Um, early years approaches that we are probably influenced by, um, there are elements of Montessori. And I know from my time at the British School that I had many excellent colleagues who'd done their training in Montessori. We're also influenced by Frebellian in influences. Um, from uh, Reggio Emilia as well. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you today about an idea called planning in the moment, um, which is our sort of, what we have as our foundation. So I'm going to move on to that now and our intent. So as I said, our starting point, the main, uh, the main sort of influence on our curriculum is from planning in the moment. You may have come across this, and I've got a little picture on my slide here of a book, front cover of a book, which you can look up on Amazon, um, written by Anna F. Grave. Um, Anna F. Grave um, ran a nursery um, in London, and she developed this idea that um, her nursery was going to be completely child-led, but how could she produce planning to show that what she was, what she was doing? And she came up with this idea of planning in the moment. 
Um, this is something I'm going to talk about a bit more in the presentation to explain it. So you can, if you're interested, um, if you look her up on YouTube, you can find a little clip of her talking about planning in the moment, um, which will help explain that. And it has some clips of practitioners working with children. So you get the idea of how um, a child has an interest in an area and then a practitioner comes along and helps the child, supports the child to develop um, that further. Um, when I started, this is what we had in place. Um, this is three years ago, but there were some complications with that approach. Um, the realities of the paperwork involved in the planning in the moment were quite extreme. And what I've worked on is trying to um, reduce the paperwork burden on myself and my team so that we can spend the maximum of our time working with the children. Um, and at the beginning as well, I found that our assessment and review process, um, our way of assessing children's progress and how we improved our setting was not really in place. So that's what I have sought to develop over the last three years. But um, in the UK, I am all the time assailed by these competing needs um, from uh, national curriculum and things like that. So we have now in reception um, baseline testing. This means a test that we perform with children when they first, in the first few weeks of them entering reception. Um, and then I repeat that at the end of the year. Um, the repeating bit is not necessarily, not really obligatory, but that's something that we do to see their progress. Baseline testing is something that's been very controversial here in the UK. Um, people felt that it was taking too much time away from practitioners' time with children um, and therefore wasn't appropriate. And they felt that testing at such a young age was also not appropriate. But it is now a fact. So it's something that we, we do at Frencham Heights. Um, another pressure we have is that in September, we will have a revised EYFS, Early Years Foundation Stage, curriculum, so a national curriculum um, that's been revised. Um, it's been changed to um, try to, again, actually reduce the amount of paperwork that practitioners are having to do, but also to slightly change the emphasis of the curriculum. Um, there's a lot of concerns that children are entering reception year um, in particular, but also nurseries, without the right amount of communication and language um, skills that we would um, want. And so there is a renewed focus on areas like that and also on emotional regulation, um, all of which actually is quite appropriate um, after the pandemic, although these revisions were actually put in place before the pandemic, interestingly. Um, you can go and have a look at that at this website, um, foundationyears.org.uk, to find out more. The other competing need I have all the time, obviously, is the year one readiness question. I think in the state system here in the UK, that's probably a greater pressure, but definitely we're all thinking, um, are the children end, ending reception in the right place to be able to move into year one? Reception's really that first experience of school for a lot of children, but we do need to, to ensure that we're providing them with the right level of skills so that they can progress well in year one. So I hope that's provided a good idea of where I started and also the pressures that I feel as a teacher. Now I'm going to show you, oh, here's a little um, picture of um, uh, some water play. This is a, a raft that we made. We got, make, got into making rafts. Um, I can't remember why, somebody's idea. Um, we made these with a glue gun. Um, the children all used, learned to use a glue gun that day. Uh, I thought you'd like to see that. Um, and we're now going to move on. Um, just now I want to tell you how we implement um, our ideas about learning in nursery and in reception. So this is really talking to you about the planning that we have in place to make sure that excellent teaching and learning happens. We have two types of planning in nursery. The first type is continuous provision planning. And I took this idea really from um, two sources, from Early Excellence, which is a, an amazing organization, um, which provides continuous professional development, lots of ideas. Um, they do, they sell furniture and resources as well. Um, but they, um, I went on some professional development and bought a book, which is all about continuous provision. Continuous provision, if you're not familiar with the idea, is the 
idea that you have um, resources, toys, um, materials, all out in your nursery or reception classroom at all times in places that the children can independently um, access. Um, so I have planning um, to support this, to ensure that we've got the right things out on the shelves for the children to use. Um, and this is a little table here on my slide, um, which shows how I set that out. And that's really taken from the Early Excellence um, Continuous Provision Planning um, Guides. Um, so this shows, this little table just shows how I take um, the national curriculum, um, the characteristics of effective learning and statements from development matters from that early years curriculum. And then I think about different areas of the classroom. So maybe it's a um, sand area or a water play area or a maths and counting area. And I think about the resources, the organization, um, the what experience I, experiences I want children to have in that area, and then the role of the adult when they come into that area. And I do this planning for all of those different areas, indoors and outdoors, and then use this as a sort of foundation, um, which we constantly review and tweak as the year goes on. Because obviously, sometimes some resources just aren't interesting to a group of children, or maybe they've not been well organised. Um, we find maybe get halfway through the term, and you think no one's used that. Um, so maybe I'm using it the wrong way. Maybe the role the adults are not helping children to use that resource very well, and they're not learning from it. Um, so. This is the first type of planning that we have. Um, and I'm very happy to answer further questions about that um, because it is new for us, um, but it's helping us to think about what we have out in the environment. The second type of planning we have in the nursery is the planning in the moment, um, which is taken from Anna F. Graves approach. And we've simplified it a lot to try and reduce the paperwork. Um, so simply all I have um, for my practitioners is a grid like this with Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and they make notes on what happened um, in the different areas and they do abbreviations, they use their own notes, um, they work really closely as a team so they can make their own notes and um, they write just on Monday, you know, maybe Honesty was really interested in the sand area, she filled up um, a small bucket and then I challenged her to fill up another bucket that was larger and we talked about big and small or we um, you know, maybe we ordered some um, containers in, in order of capacity. At the bottom where I've put the word tomorrow, that's where my practitioners will put in any ideas of learning that they think could be better developed tomorrow. Maybe there's a resource that they have at home, you know, maybe some flour or something that we can go and buy or something we can get out of a storage cupboard that we think could benefit the children. Maybe because Honesty has been interested today in the sand and ordering things, maybe there are some really enormous containers that we have um, massive buckets or something in our um, storage area or maybe we could go to our science labs and get some um, properly calibrated measuring um, uh, um, containers to sort of start looking at numbers on measuring so that's really what my practitioners in nursery use in reception we have some additional layers of planning we have the continuous provision planning, as I've explained, and we have the planning in the moment, which my teaching and learning assistant um, provides quite a lot of support. But then um, as a teacher in nurse in reception, sorry, I also plan as we go through the year short skills sessions in phonics, maths and English. Um, in some um, environments, in some entirely child led environments, you might not see that. But after a lot of uh, discussion with my head of school and with my team, we still feel it's important to provide um, discrete phonics, maths and English sessions to reception children because we feel that they can't take their learning further unless we provide some of those skills. So how can we expect a child to start producing some writing in an imaginative play area if we really haven't shown them how to form any letters or how to start orally blending and segmenting? So we did feel it's, it's necessary to do that. 
Um, and I plan for those on a weekly basis in quite a typical planning format, which I focus a lot on the outcomes. What do I what skills do I really want children to acquire from a session? OK, so that's all our implementation. And I've just got a couple of pictures here of um, children in my reception class. Um, they're playing a maths game there um, where we roll a dice and we filled up a grid um, and it was sort of first to 10. So that was a bit of a math skill session. In my classroom as well, I have on the left hand side, you can see a, a sort of very messy looking display board. This is our wonder wall, um, which we use. You can see Maddie's monster picture there, actually, um, where you can see this is where we sort of record activities that we've done, ideas that we have and questions that the children have as well well because I feel that there's a lot of planning that I do for my purposes but unless I share that with the children I don't necessarily have the ability to bring them along on the journey so we have our wonder wall at one end of the classroom and lastly I want to talk about the impact that we hope to have on our children in early years so um, here are our two impact statements um, for nursery and reception children. I'll just give you a moment to have a look at those. Um, you'll see that there is a slight difference in expectations um, at the end of both of those year groups. Um, I think the uh, idea about um, children leaving nursery eager to become more independent and eager to have more responsibility and then really seeing that in practice in reception is something that's very important to us um, in our setting and I've used the word skills in the reception children's um, uh, impact statement because we really are expecting them at the end to be skillful and motivated and being able to put to use some of the skills that we have hopefully been teaching them throughout the year and they've been acquiring. Um, and so in terms of our impact, I do sort of need to talk about our assessment and review and how we uh, are ensuring that we are having the impact that we want to have on the children. We use a, an app called Tapestry, uh, which is an online learning journal. You can have the app on tablet devices and you can also log into the website on your laptop. And this is where I've got an example here of um, an observation that we have from of Honesty Walker. Um, uh, it's a pretend child. Um, and we use Tapestry to share with parents that first element of my slide, so the writing with quills element and the photo and the description. And then the second element is for us as practitioners to think about where our children in their learning. So this bit of writing with quills um, showed evidence that Honesty was able to use her phonic knowledge to write some words um, which match her spoken sounds. So um, those statements can be a bit clunky. They're taken from the um, development matters. Not everything that a child does always fits into that. So sometimes we have to sort of make a best fit judgment. Um, but this is our way of assessing and reviewing children constantly. So this is our continuous assessment that we're doing. Um, and I'm happy to talk about tapestry more. I know I'm, I'm whizzing through things here a bit. And then in order to track that progression, because you could just log things on tapestry, you could just log loads and loads of observations and never sit back and think about it. We do as a team meet every week. And in that meeting, I expect all practitioners to bring one child to the table that they want to talk about, um, not physically, obviously the children are out in the playground, hopefully at this point. And we sit down and we look at that child's profile on tapestry. And we look in particular at this little, we've done a little snippet here of a child's next steps. So this shows um, how tapestry helps us um, in a very quite blunt way um, to show where a child is and what we need to do to get into the next step. So this just shows how honesty in her personal, social and emotional development um, needs to progress um, to maybe being able to negotiate activities with other children um, because maybe honesty isn't very good at uh, that yet. Maybe honesty finds it difficult to share things and to talk to other children. Um, so that's how we do that on an ongoing basis. 
Obviously, we have parent meetings um, every term. We also have reports to parents so that we can share where children's overall progress is as well. Um, and then at the end of reception year, um, we provide for our local county council um, a set of data about where all the children are at the end of reception year. And that's called the Early Years Foundation Stage Profile. So there is a summative assessment as well at the end of early years. So that is all about how we hope to have the right impact on children. And um, there's one more lovely picture of the beautiful grounds we have at Frensham Heights um, out in one of the meadows. You can see our uh, solar panels over in one corner as well. Um, and then I was just going to finish today um, and hopefully have some time if you have any questions um, in a moment on my personal reflections, um, the strengths and weaknesses of our approaches really, because. I don't feel in any way that we have a perfect um, curriculum. Um, it's a living, breathing thing that we're always looking to improve. I'm at this point and I might speak to you again in a year's time and find that we have developed this even further. Um, in terms of strengths of this curriculum, I do feel that we are using our daily observations to their fullest extent. Um, tapestry is a great tool to help us do, do that, but it means that we're not just recording things for recording's sake, we're actually using it to think about where children are. Um, we're trying to balance completely child-led approaches with some rigor. So we're just trying to have a bit of balance there, but we're still ensuring that, you know, all children are getting access to phonics. It's not just children who are always in the writing area or who are always in the book corner, um, but we're also making sure that they're all getting an opportunity. Um, and also I feel that it's quite a good way of ensuring that our curriculum coverage is balanced so that we are constantly, we can go back and look at the end of a week of our, in our planning in the moment and see, well, really, have we throughout the week touched on all areas of our curriculum or not? Um, weaknesses, on the other hand, I've got, is it still a bit paperwork heavy? I don't know. We need to keep chipping away at that um, and see um, how well we get on. We don't have quite so much disruption from COVID I'm hoping this year, so we will have a better idea of it. Um, it is reliant on good quality observations and that I'm very fortunate in having um, experienced early as practitioners, but um, as we bring new people into the team, that's something that we need from them um, because if we don't have the good quality data at the beginning with the observations, then it's difficult to use that to build on and improve our curriculum and our environment. Um, I do, we have a small setting at Frenchman Heights. Um, we have small class sizes. It's an independent school. So whether this is all as transferable elsewhere, I am not sure. And that's where maybe colleagues online today would have some thoughts about that. There may be bits that you could pick and choose, but maybe not everything would work for you. Okay. And just coming to the end now, really. Um, and that's my um, email address honestywalker at frenchham.org. If you'd like to connect, um, if you'd like to um, send me any questions, that would be great. I very much see today as an opportunity to uh, talk to peers um, in the early years environment elsewhere. So um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I know I rattled through quite a lot there, probably missed out lots of things as well. So if you've got thinking, oh, she hasn't done this, then uh, probably I've forgotten it. Um, but it's delightful to speak to you. Thank you very much. That was absolutely brilliant, Darcy. Hi. <laughs> I rattled through it rather a lot, yes. so I hope colleagues are okay. <laughs> no, so, so, so that's the beauty of it. We have some... Some of our audience on fa Facebook, some of them yes. are on YouTube, and yeah. there are some on LinkedIn as well. So I'm trying to just catch up the questions wherever mm -hmm. they're coming from. And um, this video is going to be there for them to see and re-see, right. and so so they will yes. get what, what you said. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's an opportunity to to link up later on as well. That's um, enough to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so you uh, spoke about continuous assessment, and I, mm. I know uh, from working with uh, you in at the Bridges School, we had a lot of narratives that we gave out and we wrote about the children in different domains. So mm. there's a question on Facebook, and um, Goldie is asking if these assessments that you speak about, I know they can be very cumbersome when you're writing. So are mm. they just narratives, or do you have some grades 
uh, as well, which you give to the children? Yeah. So what we would do is, um, you know, it's a judgment thing. I think it's it's experience as well. Um, there is so when you write an observation, um, you do want to try and keep that to what is happening um, at the time. Sometimes I find um, with my tablet in the environment, I literally just take a photo and I write a heading. And then later on in the day, maybe in uh, at the end of school, I have the time to elaborate on what was going on. There's enough with just the photo and the heading to prompt that. Then I would write a few sentences of what was going on. Um, so as the one you, you saw, I shared with you, there was, you know, the group had shown interest in knights and castles. And then we um, talked about how they wrote and somebody knew about writing with feathers, with quills. And, and so that's what I wrote about. And then with tapestry, um, and I think there are other online um, learning journals that can do this as well. You then have the ability as a practitioner, and you don't have to share this bit with parents because it can be confusing for parents. You have an option to then click on different areas of the curriculum and then a set of statements come up. And those statements are linked to the different age bands of children. So you might have statements for children who are 22 to 36 months. So that's sort of just below three. Um, some for 40 to 60 months, some for 50 months plus, and then for the early learning goals. So you can attribute what is happening, what you've observed to a child's age band. And you look at the statements under that age band. because So you'll see, for example, maybe in uh, writing, for example, in literacy, you might expect children at 40 to 60 months might be forming some recognizable letters, maybe the first letter of their name, maybe they're beginning to form some other ones, but maybe they're sometimes they're not forming them correctly, um, or maybe they have got some reversals. Sometimes children go through periods where they write mirror writing, don't they? And all sorts of things happen. Um, maybe somebody's pencil grip isn't great. Um, maybe somebody's pressure on the paper isn't always that consistent. Um, so you can choose some statements that fit where that child's development is, because you might also have children who are way beyond, um, you know, the sort of where you'd expect a child of five to be. Maybe some children are already writing in sentences. Um, maybe some children are able to um, use some punctuation. So you can then using tapestry, it gives you these sort of drop downs and you can click on which statements. So it's actually quite a quick process then. Um, mm -hmm. And it just all gets logged on the child's online learning profile. Um, and it constantly um, sort of updates where their level of learning is, because you might have several observations on, on writing, for example, in a week. They might be at slightly different levels. Tapestry will work out a sort of average level for that child's um, current learning so it's it's a really useful tool yeah so that's really comprehensive and i remember during the british school days you walking around with register and doing a traffic light because we didn't have tablets at that point in <laughs> that so this is this is very very comprehensive and i think mm -hmm. even if a school doesn't have this kind of a system where you know you're talking about tapestry even mm -hmm. if we have the, the different bands of development yes. if we've written them out we'll be able to color them you out and say highlighter them. pen yeah exactly yes. you can use your highlighter pen which is exactly what i was doing in a previous setting where we didn't have tapestry i just had a printout in a folder of a child's learning journal and i could just do that maybe just every half term because you're also mm -hmm. using your teacher knowledge sometimes as well and yeah. as I explained in my presentation the the statements about a child's what they're doing can be quite clunky and don't always fit what the child's yeah. doing they're so diverse aren't they um yeah. so yeah teacher knowledge is hugely important and actually I think here in the UK we're putting a lot more emphasis on that which is really good news and um, trusting teachers more to know their children Absolutely. I'm also trying to keep an eye on the questions which are rolling in there. Uh, you know, I really love the, the phrase that you use, the living and breathing curriculum. And yes. it just gets so much of, you know, a, a vision which is organic, which is developing with the children. And mm -hmm. uh, I think um, uh, what we also liked in your, in your presentation was when you said, that the learning is child centric, but the rigor is there as well, so that mm. the learning goals don't get missed out. So uh, there's Ritu uh, on Facebook, and she's saying hi. If you oh, remember, hi, Ritu. yes, Ritu. I watched her presentation the other day. It was really good. 
<laughs> yes, it was. It was. So, yeah. uh, Sonali has a question. Uh, do you think the educators need to make a parameter for each concept? Oh, I'm not. Can you explain that a bit more? Do you think she can so, ask me? Yeah. So if you if you think like we were talking about, uh, you know, the different uh, areas which you can highlight and you can say mm. where the child is at. So uh, what what she is uh, talking about is like suppose you're doing something like uh, a concept, um, maybe um, the solar system. Yes. For instance. Yeah. So do, do you think we need to have these parameters per topic or it should be per skill? No, I think it needs to be per skill, definitely, um, because the topics, if you're following a child led curriculum, then the topics are going to be so wide ranging. Um, it's based on every individual child's interests. So if you were doing something like the solar system, I would be looking for skills, you know, where is a child able to um, talk about experiences from their own background? So if you're looking at the solar system with very young children, their experiences might be from when they've been outside, there's been a bonfire, they've seen some stars in the sky, or they've seen the moon at the end of a telescope, or they've just been going for a walk at night with their family, um, you know, when it's a bit cooler maybe, and they've seen the moon and they can see all these things, the grey patches and white patches on the moon and what's all of that. And, you know, if they come into school and they're able to talk about that, then that shows a sort of developmental level, doesn't it, in terms of their communication and language, their understanding of the world. Um, if they are able to um, use, if you've got things like may, maybe pretending to make a telescope, you could go to your junk modeling, get some old, um, you know, cardboard tubes, make yourself a telescope, think about um, technology. So you start to bring in all different areas, but really it's, I don't think you need to say, oh, a child at four must know all the names of the planets um, or a child at four must know the distance from the Earth to the sun. We're really looking for um, those skills of understanding, explaining their knowledge, using and applying their knowledge elsewhere, you know, practicing skills like making objects that are linked to those that understanding. We're looking at that level, really, because those skills are then applicable elsewhere. Um, in their learning. Absolutely. And uh, honestly, I don't know if you are aware, uh, we have developed our own curriculum uh, okay. two years back. We we call it the CREATE. It's an acronym, uh, the yeah. CREATE curriculum. Uh, you must be seeing it on Facebook. We advertise it there and it's yeah. absolutely skills-based. Mm, yeah. Uh, uh, what I what I want to point in here is yesterday uh, the school that we've been working for the last uh, two years, Silver Line in Ghaziabad, uh, the children in year two, so uh, class two would be year three for England. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They 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 created uh, progression charts on storytelling, and uh, they had, if you please, they did critical thinking with the Freya model. Oh, so, wow. Yes, so it was absolutely amazing. Yesterday was a very satisfying day for me yeah. to see the curriculum give that. So yeah. I, I agree with you completely that we have to stress on skills uh, yeah. rather than the content because that's going to change like forever. Yes. And content just changes like that, doesn't it? You know, yes. we are... I remember um, when I was working with you going to a really great um, inset as a uh, British school and um, somebody was talking to us about the fact, and I've heard this since then, that, you know, at the moment you and I cannot imagine the jobs that the children in our nurseries and receptions are going to be doing. Those jobs don't mm -hmm. exist yet. Mm -hmm. So the idea that we need to fill them full of facts and figures now that they're going to somehow need in 20 years is a bit pointless because we have no idea what they're going to need in 20 years and you know with the challenges of climate change you know pandemics and things like that we, you know we we can't we couldn't have predicted what was going to happen two years ago so i think that skills is you know if we can provide them those lifelong learning skills um they're going to be powerful learners that we need um for the yeah. future yeah, absolutely. So there's one last question, uh, yeah. honesty, uh, and it's from Pratima who says, uh, what about inclusive uh, education? How do you fit no. a child who has uh, special needs in this entire yeah. scenario? Yeah, um, this is we have a children with a range of needs in our setting. Um, so, yes, it is a constant 
um, a constant, you know, thing at the back of our minds as well, that we're looking at, you know, are we making sure that they can so follow their interests at the right level for them, but that we're also, are we ensuring that if there is a barrier to their learning, are we helping them with that barrier? And are we monitoring their progress as well? Um, so really with children who have additional needs, we can still use tapestry, we can still use that assessment and review process. And obviously within a class, you've got children who might be working on very different levels, for example, with their mm -hmm. phonics, uh, learning sounds in order to read and write might be very, very different. So you can track that. Um, then I would also say you're looking at your environment and um, that ability to that planning in the moment idea um, mm -hmm. where you maybe have something out in your environment and um, the children take out, let's say it's a set of cubes with numbers one to 20 on that they could order. Um, you may have some children obviously in your setting that are not yet ready for that or find it very difficult to recall the number order, for example. Um, you can then make a note of that on your planning on that day and then say, tomorrow, I need to take that child and maybe go and do a bit of skills building because they really couldn't, weren't sure when they were counting, you know, with uh, for example, with numbers between 12 and 20, a lot of children get muddled up between 15 and 50. And yep. recording that, either in your planning or in an observation, gives you that opportunity to go back and look at that. Now, is that a problem with, uh, as a child, just not hearing it correctly? They just need a bit of, a, a little bit of um, extra help with that. Or is this part of an underlying issue? Um, you know, is this uh, maybe some evidence of special educational needs going on? And if there is, then let's make notes of that over a few days or a few weeks um, to see if there are additional needs. And then, you know, if there are, then we can start to bring in um, maybe some expertise from elsewhere. But yeah, very much so. We have a, we have children with special uh, with speech and language difficulties. We have children um, on the autistic spectrum as well in our setting. So it's a non-selective um, school. Um, so we get a wide variety of needs. Yeah, like most of the UK schools, I think, and uh, uh, the schools are, I think, um, equipped with teachers who can deal with. Uh, different situations. I really love the idea of in the moment honesty, and yeah. I'm just visualizing uh, this this planning uh, happening by the children, where they say, "Okay, today yeah. we've done this, and tomorrow I could yeah. do that." Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. And you have that ability at the end of every day before everyone goes home. You can gather your class together on the carpet, and you might have children who've made a model out of cardboard boxes or who've painted a picture. And children then can start talking about what they've done, and you can really start to get children to say, "Well, then tomorrow I would like to yes. do this next," and take control of their learning. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So this has been really uh, engaging for my community, honesty, right. and uh, we we look forward to more sessions and more uh, sort of resources from you when you know the strategies that you spoke yeah. about, and uh, with our uh, national uh, education policy giving us so much, I think we can uh, incorporate uh, a lot of strategies that you spoke about. Thank you so much for being with us, uh, Honesty, and uh, uh, addressing addressing my friends uh, here yeah. on the channel and uh, wish you all the best. Well, it's, it's always a pleasure, Deep Tea, and um, I wish you luck and I wish all my colleagues luck as well with, uh, and I guess you're all at school at the moment because we've not gone back to school yet, so we go back in September. But, no, um, we haven't as well, so our schools are so all online, yes. Good luck, good luck with the start of term then. Um, you too, you too. All right, thank you then. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.